Welcome to the Rocky Mount Area Buzz. Our guests today are Gene Wilson, Executive Director of the Tar River Mission Clinic, and Cindy Worthy, who's Chairman of the Board. We've got lots of great things to share with you today. Our show today is being brought to you proudly by Roger G. Taylor & Associates to help to communicate with you the many wonderful things happening in our area. And let's take a look at some of the recent events. One of the happiest things that I get to do from time to time is to introduce and announce the Chamber's Distinguished Citizen Award. Over the years, the one quality of all of these winners has been that they have consistently enhance the quality of life in our community. That he is an amazingly talented physician and his compassion for people is his hallmark. So probably the primary reason for this award is the way our recipient put that compassion to work for the poor and the underprivileged and those who live on the underside of life. For him, that meant a strong desire to offer medical care for those uninsured and unable to afford it. Back in 2007, a group of people met informally to discuss a free medical clinic in our city. In every group that advocates a cause, there has to be one person who is willing to roll up his or her sleeves and tackle the nuts and bolts of putting the project together. Tonight's honoree became the moving force behind that free clinic to help meet those needs. He recruited other doctors. He enlisted volunteers. He led fundraising. He sought out a building. He helped hire a director. The result was the beginning in 2008 of the Tar River Mission Clinic, which began providing care for the low income and the uninsured. Since that time, he has continually treated clinic patients and chaired the board that oversees clinic operations. I'm not going to bore you with statistics, but two figures stand out. In the past four and a half years, there have been more than 6,000 patient visits to the Tar River Mission Clinic. That clinic has provided or arranged over four million dollars worth of free medical health services. Nash Healthcare Systems has been an invaluable supporter by providing clinic space and free laboratory and radiology services. But it was our recipient who was the founding father, who helped give birth to the idea, and who stayed with it from conception all the way through to fulfillment. He answered the biblical challenge to do it for the least of these who are unable to afford their own care. Our honoree has not accomplished these things by himself. He was lovingly supported by his wife and partner, Irene, until her death. 
After a time, along came Sharon to relight the candle and to provide a new sense of purpose. His daughter, Kim, and Sharon's adult children, Heath, Amber, and Jessica, complete the immediate family. And there may even be some other family members and good friends who are lurking somewhere in the shadows tonight to help celebrate this event with him. I was his patient. He was my parishioner. But most of all, he is a valued friend. And I know him well enough to know that he will be very, very uncomfortable receiving this award. In fact, our greatest challenge was in figuring out a way to get him here to give it to him. But he is here. And here he is. The winner of this year's Chamber of Commerce Distinguished Citizen Award is Dr. John Derbyshire. <clears throat> That was really fun to see Dr. Derbyshire. I mean, who doesn't love Dr. Derbyshire? That's right. I mean, he's even got a nickname Derby. So, I mean, <laughs> I just, this community adores him. Mm -hmm. and, and the Chamber's annual banquet where he was given the Distinguished Citizen Award, there wasn't a person there that didn't go, oh, kind of when they heard who was winning it. What, what a true servant mm -hmm. with a heart of gold mm -hmm. um, for helping other people. And, Gene, you, when did he first, well, and, and Cindy, as the role you're going to be talking about as chairman of the board um, of directors, which is a, a very strong, committed volunteer board through the years. But Gene, you started off part-time working, and then it, and they were just, it wasn't as many days of the week and that type of thing as it was, but you've, it's evolved into a full-time, very demanding position for you, hasn't it? Well, it's full-time, and it started out full-time. Uh, we started in May of 2008 mm -hmm. uh, after the Board of Directors had spent the first part of that year kind of forming and getting the bylaws together and getting it incorporated. And then uh, we spent most of that spring and summer putting together policies and procedures and medical protocol and uh, insurance and all the things that go along with running a medical clinic. and. Um, started screening for patients in uh, July of that summer of 2008 and opened our doors the first week of August in 2008 with a one night a week clinic. And the one night a week, yeah, that was a, and, and it, how quickly did it become clear you needed to, to avail services more than that one night a week? Well, we started out, we had a lot of volunteer participation with the physicians, obviously something new and everybody was excited about it. and. Um, I think we were pretty successful in meeting that need for the first year mm -hmm. with the one night a week and we would certainly have big nights. We would have as, as many as 20 to 25 patients on a Thursday night that we would see. Um, but in late 2009, I think, and I'm probably going to get messed up with the dates, we did expand to a second night a week and it was a little bit smaller. We only had one volunteer physician that did that. Uh, and then later on in uh, 2010, we expanded to our daytime clinics as well. We still retain a Thursday night clinic where the volunteers mostly run it and see patients. What is the criteria for having someone be, be able to be seen there? Well, our mission is to serve the low income and uninsured. So we pretty much stick to that criteria. Uh, we define it as being a family, member of a family that lives at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Uh, and then obviously does not have any access to public or private insurance resources. So obviously no access to a Blue Cross Blue Shield type of policy or access to public resources like Medicaid or Medicare. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really designed for that uninsured low income population. And you started out at a different location. We did. We started out at the uh, uh, the Edgecombe County Health Department on Atlantic Avenue. Uh, they were gracious enough to lend us some space there 
but then Nash Healthcare System, uh, who has been a great supporter of the clinic mm -hmm. from the beginning, not only with a lot of folks on our board, but uh, also just their support of our operations. And uh, they had some vacant facilities over at the Community Medical Plaza off of Jeffries Road. Life Care Community Hospital is the main mm -hmm. facility there. And so we occupy some clinic space thanks to their generosity uh, there. And it's really uh, high quality space. I mean, it's designed as a medical clinic, has seven exam rooms, several administrative offices, a real nice waiting room. So the patients get an experience uh, just like they would if they were going to any private clinic in town. Mm -hmm. so. and, and payment scale, how does that happen? Well, we're, we're free clinic, so we're at this point, we Good. remain mm -hmm. free to those, and that's why we qualify the patients, mm -hmm. that we want to make sure that we're serving that demographic, that um, we don't want to create a barrier to care. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and surprisingly, even uh, as little as 15 to $25 in a, in a payment for an office visit, um, is often perceived by them as a barrier. Mm -hmm. And so we've so far been successful in maintaining our services as free. And I want to come back to you to share some of the success stories in just a minute. But Cindy, um, Jean already has referenced Nash Healthcare Systems where you work as being a major partner in this. And, and of course, your willingness to come in as chairman of the board. Um, and I think Larry Tooney, the CEO, is on the board as well as a number of people currently and in the past. But what some of the things that Nash Healthcare Systems does to support Tar River Mission Clinic? Well, um, what we quickly realized in 2009 when we were um, housing the clinic over at the health department is that we didn't have enough space. Mm -hmm. And the at that time, the office space that we're currently using had been vacated. And it was just the perfect setting. It was already set up for a physician's office. Mm -hmm. So now we not only provide the space and we assisted Jean with getting the room set up and equipped, but we also um, provide free lab and radiology services. Wow, um, that's, it, that's significant. I mean, right. without that, Jean, I mean, I, Sure. You would, the diagnostic ability would be severely limited to. Right, and it, 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 it assists the physicians in being able to better treat their chronically ill patients. And we do run, um, help me out, Jean, 600 to 800 um, patients that come on a regular basis. We are their primary care. Mm -hmm. That if we were not there, they would not have a place to go. We're heavily invested in it because, one, it's the right thing to do for the community, but also it really helps us, too, because we know if these patients did not have a primary care home, they would be seeking their care in the emergency room, which is a very expensive um, venture for primary care. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it serves us in two ways. We're meeting the needs of the community, which is a part of our mission, mm -hmm. but we're also helping um, in some small way decrease the volume hitting the emergency room. And not waiting until things reach the acute level, but Absolutely. provide management. Right for various disease, mm -hmm. disease states. Jean, we've got just a minute before the break, but give us an example of somebody who came in terribly in need of a, a, a primary care home that you've seen just really have a, a big change in their life because of what you all do? Well, a typical patient would, would be somebody who, is, who has either been in the emergency room recently uh, or has been to the health department. Some, many of them have received an initial diagnosis of one of the chronic conditions that we focus on. A typical patient would probably suffer from multiple chronic conditions, diabetes, hypertension, uh, some form of heart disease uh, with, you know, lipid disorder, and very few of our patients are, are a, a single diagnosis. So uh, it makes for a pretty complex patient to care for. Mm -hmm. uh, chronic disease, is, as Cindy knows, is, is just the killer of the medical system. So much of the resources are consumed by those conditions. and. Um, and quality of life. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've had folks that have come in and had, you know, not, a, not to get technical, I'm not qualified mm -hmm. to get technical, but had 
uh, an A1C reading, which is a diagnostic test for a diabetic that is just literally off the charts, indicating that their diabetes for three to six months has just been totally out of control. And if left like that, it ultimately leads to very serious complications. Mm -hmm. So we would get them on insulin, get them the diagnostic tests that they need, and uh, just set up a management of their mm -hmm. care and may see them four, five, six times a year to help them manage those conditions and, and stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Which benefits the patient, the patient's loved ones, and the community at large mm -hmm. because a healthy person is a productive, happy right. person. So let's take a break. Um, we want to talk about the effect of the Affordable Care Act on you all looking forward. So stay with us. We'll be right back. thank Roger G. Taylor and Associates for making this program possible and welcome back to, to Jean and Cindy talking about Tar River Mission Clinic. I referenced and, and we talked about it during the break the Affordable Care Act and of course there are so many unknowns and you all are being impacted. Cindy you want to jump in and talk about how it's kind of impacting the unknown quantity is impacting the Tar River Mission Clinic too. Right. Um, I mean you know I think the whole um, air of health care is really uh, in a st state of unknown um, with how Obamacare is going to, or the Affordable Care Act, is going to impact every level of health care, but that also includes the free, free clinics mm -hmm. throughout the country, not just our little clinic, but throughout. Um, you know, we're right now. Um, before the uh, Affordable Care Act, there was estimated 53 million Americans uninsured that could potentially be covered. Well, the last statistics is 23 million will not be covered even with the Affordable Care Act. So we know there still is a place for free clinics mm -hmm. or for churches or for some other charitable agency to be assistive with either financial support or, in our case, a free clinic where they actually can receive primary care. Um, free clinics, though, are in an air of unrest, unsettlement, because we have been dependent on community donations um, as well as grants, and that environment is changing right now. Um, so we're, we at our cl clinic, the board, the executive board, we've had some strategic planning and some high-level discussions about what are we going to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you what's know, the window when you think, uh, 2014? 2014. So throughout so, this year, things will probably run as they are, but right. you'll be having to look, look and reassess going right. forward. Right. We will. You know, we're going to still continue our, our, our mission and our goal is to continue a free model. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not sure if we can exist on just a free model. We've talked about do we need to uh, apply for a Medicaid um, and, so we can receive Medicaid uh, funding. But then that changes your whole, whole environment. So. We're, the board is really working diligently on this about where we need to go. We know it still needs to continue mm -hmm. to exist for our community. We've got, like we did earlier before the break, wonderful stories. Mm -hmm. You know, with um, I, I can think of a gentleman that came in and he was a diabetic. He had a very high A1C level and he um, was out of work. Because and of that, as a result of that. Uh, I think he had he had been laid off, lost his job, did not have any insurance, did not take care of himself. Um, but he did come in, was referred into the clinic, and um, we got his diabetes stabilized. We do a lot of education, a lot of nutritional counseling. Um, as he has said, um, a lot of, um, I don't want to say reprimanding, that's not a good one. <laughs> Um, strong encouragement, encouragement. Uh -huh. to follow the medical plan that, that has been designed for him. Mm -hmm. 
and now his diabetes in, is in control and he actually is working. Great. That's the success story. Yeah, and I think because you see people like that and, and, and to not have a primary medical home when one has the disease stage gene that you referenced, I mean a lot of the people in this area do have hypertension, um, high blood pressure of course, and and diabetes, I think this is one of the, the major areas in, in the country right. where you see that and to, to be able to follow that. I want you, Jean, to talk about the volunteers because I think the community at large would just be thrilled if they knew of the generosity of health care providers. Well, volunteers continue to be a pretty strong part of the clinic, no doubt, but we have gravitated more toward a paid staff. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt about that, and our volunteer group has kind of coalesced around a, a core group that uh, continues to volunteer on the Thursday night, like I indicated. Uh, Dr. Guy McLean, who is currently with Eastern North Carolina Medical Group, is, a, is probably our most frequent volunteer physician. Uh, Sam Wasanga, who used to practice at Boyce Willis and is now practicing at Duke in Nightdale, uh, continues to volunteer. Uh, Dr. Bill Harden, who is a hospitalist at NASH, is our volunteer medical director, and he volunteers quite frequently. And we have several uh, specialty physicians that we've established relationships with over the years. Uh, Dr. Charles Jerry, who's a nephrologist, and as you can imagine, we have a percentage of our patients who are in the beginning stages of kidney disease, mm -hmm. kidney failure, as a result of diabetes and hypertension. And, um, so he comes probably every six weeks to see a group of patients that are in that state. And uh, we also have some uh, gastroenterologists in the community that have agreed to see patients that need some of their services. They will usually see them at their own practice, but they've been kind enough to volunteer, not charge mm -hmm. our patients. So. so it's a referral. So if somebody right. needs mm -hmm. something beyond yeah. primary, you have relationships. We have some, mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. We've developed mm -hmm. quite a few. Mm -hmm. Well, that's and, and ladies, you've had I think you had nurses and other people we do. We such have. as that volunteering actually mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. you got more of a, a paid staff. Mm -hmm. We still have a big group of volunteer nurses. It's probably fifteen to twenty that that come in, and we have since the beginning had a, a pretty substantial relationship with the Nash Community College nursing program. Oh, so good. So the students under the supervision of a faculty member come in on Thursday nights, mm -hmm. as many as four to five of them, and. Mm -hmm. They're usually in their last year, and they participate in patient care under the supervision of that uh, nurse. So uh, it's, it's kind actually of not the same as a volunteer, mm -hmm. but but it's right. but but they're you know they're gaining something from it, mm -hmm. and we are too. Mm -hmm. So what about prescriptions? And I, I say that with the knowledge that that Almonds has worked, Almonds Drugs has worked with y'all through the years. But right. you also have a lady who helps with accessing good drug prices too, right? Yeah, that's one of our programs is prescription assistance and Terry Taylor is our coordinator. Um, and it's really, you know, it's a, we designed the programs to work together. It really, I tell people, it does no good to have a physician if the physician can't get access to medication, mm -hmm. can't get access to the diagnostic testing. None of it works without the circle mm -hmm. being completed. So. Um, in terms of the value of services we provide, I mean, the medical medication assistance is probably one of the biggest just mm -hmm. because so many of the medications that these folks need are, are very expensive. And mm -hmm. we work through a number of different pharmaceutical companies to obtain medication for them, as well as a, 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 a pharmacy in North Carolina. It's a safety net pharmacy called Medicis based in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So uh, she does a lot of that work for our patients, and we actually serve other patients with other clinics as long as they meet our eligibility that we described earlier. And actually, the medication assistance program started before the free clinic. It, it was the seed that was planted in 2004. Mm -hmm. We started the medication assistance program, and it evolved with board members from that program evolved into spearheading the free clinic because we saw such a need not just like Jean said it takes full circle mm -hmm. not just medication assistance and it's it's so well named the Tar River Mission Clinic mm -hmm. because it is it's truly a a gift to the community mm -hmm. to, to help improve lives in so many ways well Cindy and Jean thank you thanks thank for you. sharing the story and thank you for joining us we'll see you next week mm -hmm.